Hello, and welcome to the World Affairs Council of Charlotte's International Women's Day series. My name is Noah Amaris, and I am the Assistant Director with the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. And we have a great panel lined up for us today. Our program title is Break the Bias, Advancing Gender Equality in the Workplace. And our panelists today are all with Bank of America, um, excluding our moderator. And with our first panelist is Rena Arline, who is the Managing Director and Program Director at the Bank of America Breakthrough Lab. And we have Carolina Coe, who is Director and Senior Relationship Banker, and Tia Young, who is a Director and Project Manager. And this program will be moderated by Laura Meyer Wellman, who is a WAC Board Director and the former President and CEO of E4E Relief. All right, and I would like to give a big thanks to our program partner, Bank of America. Thank you so much for putting this program on with us. It's much appreciated. And I'd also like to extend our thanks to our corporate partners, many of whom are in the audience today. So thank you very much. As you may know, global education is our passion. As the community's premier global education, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, the World Affairs Council believes everyone deserves access to fact-based and balanced analysis, commentary, and research on critical global issues. Dialogue, knowledge, active participation, and an understanding of global issues are critical for our democracy to flourish at all levels. And a couple of housekeeping <coughs> items. Today, your microphone will be on mute and your camera will be turned off for the duration of the presentation and to submit a question at any time, which we do encourage you to do because we have so many things we can talk about. Uh, you can put those questions in the Q&A box out at the bottom and um, please do not use the chat. This presentation will be recorded and sent out to all of the people on our WAC mailing list. So please make sure that you're signed up to receive the World Affairs Council mailing. And we have a few upcoming programs with the council. Our next program is on March 17th and it's the WAC Speaker Series with His Excellency Alejandro Solorio, who is the Principal Legal Advisor to the Government of Mexico in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for a program titled Resurging Stronger, Tightening Mexico-U.S. Relations in Uncertain Times. On April 12th, we have the Young Professionals of the World Affairs Council International Career Panel, which will be a hybrid program. And on May 18th, we have a WAC private dinner with Mark Polymeropoulos, who is the former CIA head of clandestine operations in Europe and Eurasia. And that is followed by a luncheon on May 19th with Mark, with Mark Polymeropoulos, which is titled Clarity in Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the CIA. On May 26th, we will have the WAC Ambassador Circle Series with His Excellency Stavros Lambrinidis who is the ambassador of the EU to the United States, and Her Excellency Emily Haber, the ambassador of, ambassador of Germany to the United States. We will also be adding additional ambassadors as we get closer to the time of the program. On June 7th, we have the World Citizen Award Dinner with Brian Moynihan, who is the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. And as many of you know, this is our third rescheduled dinner. So if you're interested in hosting a table or purchasing individual tickets, please visit the World Affairs Council website for information. And we look forward to seeing you there. And finally, from June 10th to June 22nd, we have the WAC Travel Advantage Program in Spain and France, where we'll be touring the Basque Country. If you're interested in any information about our, our travel programs, please reach out to any WAC staff member. We'll be happy to help you. And we are also on all social media. So please like, share, and follow us if you would like to keep up with what the World Affairs Council is doing. And all World Affairs Council programs are recorded and posted to our YouTube as a free education resource. And so I will turn it over to our panelists today who will introduce themselves. And I thank you all very much. And I will turn it over to Ms. Rena Arlen. Thanks, Noah. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, super delighted, excited to be here with Laura and Carolina and Tia. Um, a little bit about my background. So Rena Arlen, based out of Charlotte. Uh, many of you on the line know me. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with the World Affairs Council with uh, Bank of America, I'm leading a exciting initiative that we have called uh, Breakthrough Lab, where we are focused on um, creating an impact accelerator for diverse founders, um, specifically focused around uh, ideas with FinTech and financial inclusion. Um, I've been with the bank uh, about 15 plus years, and uh, previous to my current role was, uh, was in the, on the commercial banking side. 
Um, from an uh, education perspective, I am a North Carolina, uh, I went to Guilford College, and then I went to uh, University of North Carolina for my MBA, so very much a North Carolina girl. Um, however, uh, originally and culturally, I, I'll say I stand on the shoulders of, uh, of an immigrant family that's been through two phases of immigration. Uh, one in the early 1900s from India and Pakistan, what's today India and Pakistan to Kenya, and then the second wave of immigration coming from um, Kenya to the U.S. in the 70s and the 80s. So um, very excited to be here. This is our second uh, session on uh, around uh, International Women's Day, and very glad that we have this as a tradition going forward. I guess I'll go I'll next. Turn it to you, Tia, since I'm right <laughs> yeah. next to you. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Tia Young. Um, I've been with the bank uh, about 24 years. I'm currently director and treasury product manager within um, our cash pro platform team. Um, as far as my education, I went to proud graduate of Hampton University at HBCU, as well as my MBA for um, from Queens University. Prior to being a treasury product manager, I actually have my own business, a, a management consultant firm, um, and came full circle to come back home to Bank of America. I'm excited to be here. I'm Carolina Coe. I was born and raised in Miami, Florida, um, to Cuban parents, um, similar to Rina, immigrant parents um, that were fleeing the communist country of Cuba. My dad was five and my mom was eight. And they came to the United States with the clothes on their backs and um, wanting a good life for their families. And education was paramount in our um, house. We were expected to go to college. Um, so I graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in finance and a minor in entrepreneurship. I always had a passion for New York and pursuing a career in banking. So I moved out of um, Florida to New York and I started working for Lehman Brothers. We all know where that ended. So I decided to move to um, Nashville to get my MBA from Vanderbilt University. And after graduation, I started with Bank of America back in New York as an investment banker. Ten and a half years ago. And I've been fortunate to have um, several jobs within um, the company. And currently, I am a, a senior vice president, senior relationship manager in global commercial banking. My responsibilities include a portfolio of middle market companies with revenues ranging from $50 million to $2 billion. And I'm also um, proud to be the co-chair of the Hispanic Latino Leadership Council for Bank of America here in Charlotte. And it's a pleasure for me to be on this panel with these wonderful, successful ladies, especially on a, such an important day today, because it's very important for us to share our experiences and encourage those um, in the audience. Well, thank you. And it is great to see all three of you together. That was uh, not what I was expecting. And I, uh, it's wonderful to see our trio of panelists uh, together. Uh, I'm Laura Meyer Wellman. Uh, bios are out there. I would just share with you just from a quick background standpoint that uh, my own background relates to evolving from a very different time um, in the world, i.e. the late 70s and the 80s, uh, into my life at Citigroup, uh, starting out as a little trainee and um, being assigned the Middle East Africa region as my territory. Um, I thought speaking French would enable me to be put into a European uh, grouping, but that was not to be. And as a result, this concept of gender bias, you might think uh, for me related to my Middle Eastern experience, but in fact, it was more working with my European colleagues, the male bankers, um, who were not so happy to see a female um, in what they considered their territory. So, you know, we have, uh, we have our, our perspectives um, that come from perhaps different generations, certainly in my case. And Frankly, I would have hoped we were farther along in certain ways, but in others, there have been great strides. Um, the, this panel is comprised of a very diverse group background-wise, but you know, the fact is, is that each of us may be coming with a particular background and set of experiences, generational views, but we share being female. And that does bring some context to the table that those of you in the audience who 
identify as female will certainly agree, but I think also our partners and spouses and friends um, uh, would also have their own views on our backgrounds and lives and what they can do to be supportive. So from my background, as it comes from uh, being at Citibank in the global side, Bank of America on the uh, more domestic side, working for Foundation for the Carolinas and leading a fabulous business there called Ebury Relief, I got to see um, everything from a global view to a very grassroots view in very regional parts of the United States that I had not had the chance to even visit. Um, it's with that perspective coming today that this concept of gender bias um, you know, comes to the table. And for the record, quick definition, any one of a variety of stereotypical beliefs about individuals on the basis of sex, particularly as it relates to the differentiated treatment of females and males. Um, and that is the de general framework that we're going to be using today. Um, I would uh, like us to also kind of step back and, and value um, the different sets of experiences that you're going to be hearing from today, because what is uh, really interesting to me in preparing for this is I had a set of conversations I might not have had, and I looked at some articles I might not have picked up and read. And it's kind of sad that there has to be an article out there that says many more women remain out of the workplace. How do employers win them back? Well, I think these three women today could tell you a bit about how to win them back without having to go into a, a long article. Um, then there's one that's uh, gender bias doesn't hurt women. It hurts all of us from Forbes. That is an understatement. And I think for everyone in the audience, uh, that is something to bear with us as we go through this. This is a group of, I'm going to call them bright, resilient leaders, and they're going to help us wade through some of the challenges and put a spotlight on their respective differences. But more importantly, I'm hoping that they're going to offer up ways that we can be more attuned uh, to what gender bias is and how we address it. And frankly, when it surfaces, how we can be better about um, taking actions that will be supportive of all women, whether they're friends and family or in the workplace. So we're gonna begin with some questions and we're gonna, we have to start, this is, it's COVID. There's been so much more put out there about the environment of COVID. What has made this a different experience or is it same old, same old, but just harder? And how would you describe that in terms of your work and your personal lives um, in terms of being a woman with multiple roles? Hey, who wants to go, to first? go first? I know, right? <laughs> I'm happy to. <laughs> um, so I have two young boys, an almost six-year-old and a three-year-old. So um, for me, COVID, um, like a lot of families, um, were you know a, a lot of sets of responsibilities that we had to take care of, but then also make sure that we're delivering for our bank and for our clients. Um, so I think one of the lessons learned uh, from my experience is trust the team. I think trusting our colleagues to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of deliverables, communicating up and down the chain, and just being good teammates was very important to make sure that we were all aligned, you know, we were all in videos, so not in person, so it's hard. So the communication aspect was very important. Um, but thankfully, we were able to deliver, and I think that's a good lesson to take going forward as we, as companies, think through flexible work, um, uh, flexible work environments, and what the status of work is going to be um, going forward. That trusting the team is very critical. And, you know, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so for me, COVID was really hard. I, I will say I'm from the Maryland, D.C. area. Uh, all my family's there. I do have um, people here, of course, for support. But I, I lost two very important people to me during COVID, my father and my grandmother. So you can mm -hmm. imagine having to deal with that. And what I appreciated the most, I think, about working for Bank of America is they gave me time. So I was able to go spend almost six months with my mother. Um, I was able to go stay with my dad right before he passed. So to 
me, it was hard, but at the same time, having not just my external family, but also my Bank of America family. Um, extremely supportive, and I think what I've learned is how to be patient. Okay. Um, at the same time, have empathy, and it's okay to be vulnerable. So I had to come to work and say, you know what? I'm not okay today. And that was okay. So for me, it was really understanding uh, your social circle and making sure that you have the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Laura, I'll add in, um, you know, for me, I, I, we don't have any kids, but we have um, family members that are immunocompromised. Um, so we had to be very careful around that and getting our arms around that side of things. Um, I hope my aunt is watching. And, um, uh, and the other piece was really trying to get my team moving forward. So I was uh, leading a team at that point. And what really came out of it was um, the connectivity. I learned a lot of things about my team during COVID that I would not normally have picked up on if I was showing up to Atlanta for a nice dinner and then coming back, um, you know, I was seeing them a lot more. And so my takeaway from that has been there, you know, as much as we um, prefer the one-on-one -on -one experience, which we all do sitting here, um, there is something about that virtual experience that I think can be also leveraged, especially for leaders and managers, um, where you get to know your team in a very different way. And then I will add in, there was just a lot of um, a lot of things going on at a national level, right? So whether you talk about George Floyd, uh, whether you talk about the hate crimes on AAPI, there was there was just a lot of um, national um, um, you know themes that were going on. So it was to Tia's point, there was a wellness piece that that we were trying to make sure that our teams were okay. But then there came a point to where you had to really look at yourself and say, are you truly okay? And I really appreciated the bank with uh, a lot of the wellness sessions we had internally for associates. Um, there was, you know, there's um, mindfulness sessions, there's meditation sessions. There was a lot of uh, resources that were thrown at us in terms of helping us cope through that time. Well, uh, thank you. And I would say to uh, all three of you, you benefit from being with an organization that does have a certain amount of infrastructure. Uh, to help. Nothing is a, a complete sap, but something that will help. But clearly, and, and I was going to address um, the more challenging environment specifically associated with the George Floyd plus, 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 um, and, and that that takes its toll in a way that so many people cannot internalize no matter how much they want to, quote, support a situation. Um, so talk a little bit uh, for a moment, Rena, about how you steeled yourself during that period and how did you come up from air for air and and go through your work and your life with some level of success clearly you know, Laura, are you meaning specific to uh george floyd or are you meaning just in general about covid in general i meant in general but also with those additional forces for those of yeah. us who you know don't have kids at home, or in your case, are dealing with multi generational and multi faceted background. Um, you're you're tackling something in your head, in addition to your life and your work, that is different. Um, and so the question is, it, it expands to other um, people's experiences and backgrounds as well. But how do you tackle that? How do you how do you pull yourself up to be able to move on? Rena, can we possibly get you all in the panel to speak up a little louder? I think people are having a little bit of trouble hearing you guys. Yeah, we can uh, we can move a little closer. Is that better? Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. So, Laura, I'll say um, a couple of items um, as I think about it. One, I'm a huge fan of the outdoors. So, what I realized, no matter how much I worked out indoors, I needed to get outside, uh, and that really helped me uplift. Um, from, from you know, a crappy day I was having. Um, I would also say just surrounding yourself with like-minded people. I think Tia mentioned this as well, but friends that you could talk through some of the challenges and the issues, that was huge. Uh, and then I would say the last thing was um, meditation was a big, was, was really helpful to me uh, mm -hmm. through. through. Um, the I would other say, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Go no, ahead, no, Laura. I don't know if that was just for Rena and you have all others for us. If so, then we can just I stop do. with Rena. And so let's segue to coming okay. from a Latina background and from a Black background in terms of your respective lives um, as I look at you, Carolina, and Tia. And we said we wanted to talk a little bit about the differences coming from those family as well as ethnic backgrounds. How does that, how does that gender bias concept manifest itself in your lives? Or do you even take time to think about it? Does it hit you over the head each time? Or have you come to accept, not accept, excuse me, um, have you come to internalize and redirect and challenge where appropriate? Um, well, go ahead. I can start. So as a black woman, um, for me, it's every day. So I will say, you know, let it be if it's just going outside. I, mean, I live in the uptown area and I live in a predominantly black white neighborhood. And I have been approached I'm very, you know, candidly of, hey, are you lost? I'm like, no, I live right here. So you think about, you know, I'm a black and I'm a woman. So you have the racism and the sexism that comes into play. Um, I would say also I deal sometimes with, and, and I've talked to other people, you know, what we call imposter syndrome. So, you know, do I belong? Having that sense of, okay, you know, am I here for other reasons versus comparison to my experience and my education and my success? Um, I will also say that being a black woman, a lot of times, and, and I will, you know, the reason why I came back to Bank of America, so I was here for 20, left for five, and then back for three, um, <laughs> was a lot of it had to do with the support that we have here. So as a black woman, all the, you know, different employee networks, I'm a, I'm a member of BPG, Black Professional Group, I'm on the lead, um, with this lead for women, executive council. And again, it goes back to feeling appreciated, understanding my worth. Mm -hmm. That imposter syndrome has, you know, kind of diminished because I am given the opportunities. I have great sponsors. Um, I'm able to just basically tackle whatever I'm dealing with head on, mm -hmm. knowing that I have people like this around me. Um, I know I can thrive even better. So yes, I still feel it, but I deal with it and I manage it. And at the same time, just make sure that I am okay with expressing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Thank you. Uh, we, by the way, but to the audience, we agreed we were going to talk candidly, straightforwardly, um, and not try to make this a kind, gentle conversation because it's a tough one. Um, so I'll continue on to Carolina. So. Um, living and growing up in Miami, being predominantly Cuban community, I didn't feel that I was diverse. Everyone spoke Spanish. Everyone looked like me. My family supported me, um, told me I'd be president of the bank one day, and just didn't give me any limits. Um, so for me, growing up in that type of environment, I just didn't think that I was um, diverse until I left to college and moved to New York, and especially in banking, realizing, okay, I am different, I'm a female, I'm Hispanic, and people don't look like me. And there weren't any executives either to look toward to become a mentor of mine or just to get advice from. So what I had to do was be determined and figure out my own path. And that's when I really realized that nobody was going to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, come to this table, or hey, here's a job for you. I had to work harder than anybody else. I had to be persistent. I had to tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, what about me? Um, so I think that has served me well um, in my career, making sure that I'm taking responsibility for it. Um, but I do think that the stereotypes and the biases still exist, um, even though um, I've been able to, to get to where I am. Um, but I think Education is going to be a critical part of that or continuing to be a critical part in educating our counterparts, educating our companies, and um, 
elevating our stories and panels like this showing that we are successful, that we are determined, and that we should be put in leadership. Well, as a first-gen college grad in my own family, the educational side was clearly number one. Um, my folks had a third mortgage out on the house to afford uh, university, and it was never questioned. And it sounds like all three of you um, had that. Um, so I think that linchpin that you just referenced there, Carolina, cannot be um, overemphasized. Um, in terms of the, um, the when, when gender bias does come up, how does it come up? What are examples, specific examples of triggers that we and our audience would want to be aware of because we all catch ourselves saying the wrong thing. We all catch ourselves doing the wrong thing sometimes. And we can all say it's not malicious, it's not intended, but the impact is so grave when it's consistently put in place. So what are some triggers, some words, some examples that pop to mind that you might want to share with our audience today for us to hold on to as we leave our conversation? So Laura, I'm gonna jump in. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, this is to the men in the audience. If you are in a meeting with women, please do not look at your women peers and say, take down the notes. That comes up all the time. Um, and I will say that's come up in my younger days. It's also coming up now. So just be, you know, it's not coming from a malicious perspective, but that just be thoughtful of that. Um, I have had to pull a couple of my men counterparts on the side and say, that's not what you should be asking. Or for the woman in, in the audience, you know, I would say, don't say yes. Say, why don't you take the note? Mm -hmm. um, so push back from that perspective. But what about Tia and Carolina? What have you got? Um, I would say really understanding. So for me, it's happened because I don't have children. Um, just automatically assume that, okay, you know what? You can do all the traveling. You can stay late. Um, but then on the other side, if you think about someone who does have a family, limiting them. So let them make the choice if they want to do a new job or take on additional responsibility. So I think that comes most, more so it comes towards women versus men because the assumption is that men can do it all, but we all know that women do it the best. So therefore, <laughs> it's necessary to understand that um, you know, the power of connectivity and embracing that whatever we want to do, we can do, and let us do it when we want to do it. Not a do, but let's just do it. <laughs> Carolina. And I would say quickly on that point, being a mother myself, I have been put in a position where all of my colleagues were invited mm -hmm. to events after work, and I wasn't until I finally said, hey, I'm happy to go. I'm, you know, I'll just tell my wonderful husband that he has to take care of the kids tonight and he's not going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, but I didn't think you wanted to because you're a mother. So to your point, let me make that decision for myself. Um, and then secondly, from a client perspective, I told the ladies this in a prep session that a lot, um, I wouldn't say a lot, but um, frequently when I take a male counterpart with me to prospect meetings, so I'm meeting with the CFO for the first time, I'm asking the questions and building the conversation, and they direct their answers to my male colleague. Um, so, to be honest, I don't say anything to them because I don't want it to be an awkward position. I just take it, to be honest. Um, so if anybody has any tips that you want to put in the chat on how you <laughs> deal with that, um, it'll be appreciated. But those are the types of things that I just choose to not um, not make a big stink out of and just move on with um, what I need to do to deliver for my. I, I, can I so add something, can... Carolina? I think, um, Laura, can I add something? Um, I think in that situation, I would also urge our male, male colleagues, colleagues yes. if you are in that meeting, in that, in that example that Carolina pointed out, to push on whoever you're talking to to, to um, you know, take the conversation back to the female in the audience or in that room. So our male colleagues can really be allies from this perspective. 
And I think we'll touch on that towards the end because um, there is a real positive in terms of some of the ways people can join to be supportive in these situations. I'd like to go on record that my handwriting is so bad that people learn quickly not to ask me to take notes. And I <laughs> do consider that uh, to consider. Um, so let me just, uh, let me dive into each of you briefly for a specific question as it relates to your life. And um, Tia, I know uh, you have a very powerful role model in your life. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about what stories people need to hear about women and maybe one you'd like to share very briefly with us. Sure, sure. Thank you, Laura. And you probably just saw me take a deep breath. So um, for me, yes, my powerful role model um, is my grandmother. And um, just to give you kind of a brief overview of her, I could talk about it for hours, but we don't have that long. Um, I come from a line of powerful, intelligent, beautiful, strong black women. Um, it was in our household, just like everyone said, you must go to school. At the same time, um, you are a doer and a giver. So therefore, you are here to serve others, and you have to make sure you do it. So my grandmother, for those that do not know, Gloria Richardson, um, she was a civil rights icon. And if I think about, and I kind of, you know, I have my notes here only because I can talk about it forever, but I want to just kind of list the top 10 of Gloria Richardson. So I will say she was the um, first woman to lead a prolonged civil rights movement outside the Deep South in Cambridge, Maryland. Um, she has an iconic picture of her pushing away a mm -hmm. uh, bayonet from the National Guard that was called into Cambridge because of all the ruckus that her and my mother were causing. Um, and really that, kind of labeled her as the Lady General of the Civil Rights Movement in, in 1964. In 2004, she was known as the Queen of the Side Eye within, in social media. So it's interesting how that evolved. You know, talking about being in a, in a room, she led the negotiation of the King Treaty, which was focused on the same things we're talking about today, health care, jobs, education, and housing. And she was in a room full of white men, including at the time Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Um, and there's another image of her, if you Google her, all this will come up, um, of her and Kennedy with everyone else. Um, and she still has that side eye that she, and I'm sorry, I'm not pointing at you, Rena, but she still <laughs> has that side eye where she's giving it, giving it to Kennedy. Um, another thing is she's, re, you know, they called her kind of the Malcolm X whisperer sometimes because she did it, did have conversations with him, and he sent her postcards from Mecca during his pilgrimage in Mecca. Um, this is interesting, again, talking about going back to being a woman in a, in a powerful environment and making such an impact. She was on the program to um, speak at the March on Washington where Martin Luther King had his famous I Have a Dream speech. Um, when she got up to the stage, they gave her the mic. She said hello, and they snatched the mic from her. So again, it goes back to, you know, she dealt with a lot of roadblocks and just things that came up against her. But at the same time, all the way to her very last days, um, in her young years, she passed last year at 99, her message was constantly that, you know, you have to fight for what's yours. All born with equal rights. And no matter what you're dealing with, you have to make sure that you understand your worth and make sure that you move forward and make sure everybody else understands it. So for me, coming from that type of environment, I don't have a choice. <laughs> and to this day, um, I actually seek and find ways that I can, you know, basically pay it forward and pull forward as well. So part of this conversation, what I'm excited about, and thank you, Rena, for inviting me here, is actually being able to participate in something like this, learning from my colleagues, and at the same time, hopefully adding some personal stories that can help others. Well, and you've highlighted one that there is no question had a long lasting, has had a long lasting impact. And um, any of us out there hopefully have someone um, that we can point to that had that rigor of impact, but you have a real icon going for you. Uh, so, Carolina, um, one of the things we talked about in uh, our earlier sessions is this concept uh, of your early self 
and how you would counsel the young Carolina coming into the banking world out of Miami uh, from her, her, her peeps and a, a world that you knew well, um, what would you tell Carolina at 22 uh, that you wish you'd done then? Yeah, so when I think about that, um, a quote comes to mind, um, don't be intimidated, be inspired. And I think that being intimidated comes from a place of fear. Um, and I would tell myself, you got to Lehman Brothers because you were able to show your value. You got to Lehman Brothers because um, you were able to show that you can do it. You went through the same process as your male counterparts, and you are sitting right next to them. Don't be intimidated by them. Use that and flip your mindset positively. Think of all the opportunities you have to educate them on the fact that a female Hispanic woman is just as smart or smarter than you. Um, so trying to use um, inspiration to draw up courage. And I um, tell all the, the women that are, um, that are starting in their careers as well, don't be intimidated. That's where all the stereotypes and the biases um, come into play. Don't set any limits on yourself because that is what is going to be showing to the outside world. And you don't want that stereotype to continue to persist. So know your worth. Know what, the, what value you can bring and be proud of it. Don't see being a female as um, something that is less than. You know, we, especially as, as a working mother, um, I feel like I have a superpower of being a working mother because I have a lot of responsibilities inside and outside of work. But I'm able to do it because I know my value and my self-worth. And I know that I can be a good example for those who are thinking, can I do this? Can I not? Can I raise a family and be successful? And I say yes, but it's up to you to um, forge that way um, forward. Well, I could have used that at age 22 also. So very uh, helpful <laughs> guidance there. Uh, Rena, given your international life exposure, um, could you touch on briefly just from a global perspective um, what you observe whether it's in your from your Kenyan heritage, Indian heritage, your clients, vendors, um, what's your perspective from the global side on gender bias and how's that informed who you are? Yeah, Laura, uh, you know, if, if you think about the sort of the combination of my background, which is uh, African culture with Indian culture, um, you know, it's a unfortunately historically it's been a, a patriarchal society. Uh, as have been most societies. Um, what I've appreciated, what I would just say from my family's perspective, there's some common themes here that you're hearing with the focus on education and the focus on making sure that you as a female or a girl, uh, the sky was the limit and you could go beyond that as well. Um, so just making sure that we are ensuring that we're passing that on to that, to that next generation. But globally, what I'm seeing and what's been exciting, it's been exciting, but it's also been sad. Um, so the exciting piece that I see is if I think about, um, you know, my sisters in India or in, in Africa, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of ways that they've moved forward, uh, whether it's um, those, those gender biases coming down and not being as high as they used to be. Uh, girls are earning, um, are the breadwinners for a lot of families in India and in Africa. Um, you know, they're taking advantage of, um, as they're creating small businesses and taking advantage of microloans. We all know uh, if, you can, if you can finance a woman, that finances the entire family, right? There's, there's just a lot of impact from that perspective. And then I have been uh, really excited. Uh, for the past three years, this is through Bank of America, I have uh, been participating in a mentoring program through the Sherry Blair Mentoring and Women Foundation. Um, so every year I've had a small business entrepreneur. Uh, my recent one is in Nigeria, out of Lagos, Nigeria. She is a jam distributor. Um, and it's really, really exciting to talk to her and hear about, you know, her ideas, 
how she's trying to move her business forward and how open she is and how um, she is in terms of wanting to connect and get ideas from really women all over the world. Um, so I would say those have been really exciting. And then, uh, you know, if we don't mention what's happening in Ukraine today, um, I don't think it would be right. Um, but you think about the refugee situation, and it's primarily women in Ukraine, <laughs> women and children that are impacted. Same thing with Afghanistan. Um, so women are still bearing the brunt of the geopolitical issues. There's still a lot of work to be done around reproductive rights, uh, disease, water, sanitation. Um, but I feel like we are making some progress. Uh, although when I hear some statistics in terms of gender parity, you know, the, the, the stats are, I think it was, I wrote it down, it was um, the year that we will get to gender parity is 267 years um, in the future, which, uh, which is a sad stat for us to think about. But I'm excited. Um, I, I, you know, I think um, as a global community, we are doing more. Women are feeling empowered. But there's a lot more work that, that needs to be done. So thank you, Rita, for that. And um, I am getting fielded. So I have some questions to field with you um, that have been popped. And it includes the following. It says, it sounds like the uh, WACC definition of a woman has to do with biological sex. Can you talk about how World Affairs Council approaches issues of and biases against transgender women? And I think that's a big, it's a big topic um, and not one, I mean, I know Rita, you sit on the World Affairs Council board, as do I. Um, there has been, uh, I know, a, um, a, at least one seminar I know of that talked about global issues associated with transgender, not just the male female side. Um, because it's International Women's Day, the, the concept today has been primarily focused on women. Um, but there is no question that the World Affairs Council stands for equality across the entire LGBTQ plus community. Um, and it might be very interesting to tackle something like that with a speaker down the road um, with an informed speaker on the topic. But I don't know, Rena, if you had any additional comments from your perspectives from the World Affairs Council. You know, uh, Laura, I think your point in terms of us looking at speakers that are from, uh, from the transgender community, I think that would be fantastic. Um, the other piece I was going to say was just from a B of A perspective, we've been doing a lot of um, education internally. Mm -hmm. um, our LGBTQ um, teammates have been, um, you know, pushing out uh, education. They've also been pushing out allyship um, so we can help our transgender colleagues as they, not only as they're transitioning, but also as they live their lives. But I love the idea. Um, if LJ is listening, I think we will take that as a takeaway for the next International Women's Day event is to, to bring that transgender lens. I Thank you, Rena. I want to thank the um, uh, person. We don't see the origin of the actual questions, just the, um, the, the speakers, um, uh, rather the comments coming through, but thank you for that question. Um, so this is uh, for the panel to, to think about. Um, how do you suggest a minority woman working in an organization that does not have a leadership, that does not have leadership looking like them due to create allyship to help them grow. And as I shared earlier to the group, Bank of America has a lot of resources, et cetera, but no place is perfect. Um, and uh, I'd love to have uh, comments of what you might recommend when people are dealing with that situation. Anybody want to tackle that? Sure. I mean, I will say, we just talked about kind of allyship. I think finding um, people, men, hopefully, that can actually be your partner and, and in your career. So, and great sponsors as well. I think we've all benefited from sponsors of, from all ethnicities and, um, and race and gender. But at the same time, I think it's important, especially in organizations where you don't see someone that looks like you. I, I have been there, done that, um, and again, I'm fortunate to have people that look like me in senior positions. But at the same time, if you don't, it's seek out opportunities for you to find a mentor or, or a sponsor who does not look like you. I think 
one thing that we have to do a better job of is to get to know people who are not like you. It's okay to be out, you know, get out of your comfort zone, actually sprint out of your comfort zone <laughs> and making sure that you understand people that, you know, don't live next to you in your neighborhood, that don't go to the same grocery stores and churches, that don't work right next to you um, in your office, but really expanding uh, the ability to learn more about others. Ideally, that will, you know, funnel up and down and will expand across to make sure that you do have a, a lot more diverse uh, leadership. I yeah, I, yeah, I will just add that um, from a strategic perspective, um, have the ally um, help you form a business reason why you think your company should have um, females in executive leadership positions. Um, what is the benefit to the bottom line? Because unfortunately, that's what a lot you know of companies are, are focused on. Um, and, and kind of put the DNI part aside. But thankfully, in this environment, um, we have uh, really great DNI executives across the industry and across the, um, the United States that are already championing um, increasing um, female and diverse um, backgrounds. And especially from a board perspective, too, we've seen the data that suggests that women mm -hmm. on boards. Um, the companies that women's are, women are on board, um, they actually are more profitable than those companies that do not have women on board. Um, so the data is there to support it. Um, so I would encourage you to find a way to make it into a, um, a business proposition um, to see how that works for you. Laura, I'll add in just a couple of points. One, call us. You're welcome to call us, whoever asked that question. Um, secondly, uh, just e expanding on what Carolina said, um, you know, you can go to your company and say, we need to create, um, so it's not only about seeing women in leadership, but that we need what we call affinity groups, so that we need a diverse women leader, women, women's group, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so you can definitely do that. And then I'll say just personally for me, I have left organizations because I did not see the diversity in those organizations, and there's some stats out there that say about 60 to 70 percent of people, especially women, are thinking about that and are making, are looking at the organizations they belong to uh, from that perspective. So, um, you know, I'm not suggesting that you leave, but certainly there, there are a lot of, um, a lot of other options to, um, to explore. Well, excellent points. Um, there is another question here that kind of leads into it that I want to pull up because there's, it's, a, it's a good segue to our discussion. Um, where do you imagine the most significant changes to gender equality will occur? Now, you're not asked here to be, you know, prescient. It's more looking at the landscape. And I'm going to jump in and just say, first of all, the law is the place that starts a lot of change. So I'm going to put law, uh, legal changes is where it has to occur in some measure. That said, what other areas do you see as critical to where gender equity will evolve? I'll say in, 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 the, um, in the arena of uh, data, um, you know, T and I have been working on a curriculum for our cohort. Um, and one of the things that's come out is around artificial intelligence and how AI is being um, formulated. And a lot of it is, and it has biases inbuilt already. A lot of that is because it's men that have been building that. So how can we get more women in STEM and technology um, so we don't have those biases? But I think that's a big, a big frontier that um, we need to tackle as a globe. Mm -hmm. I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I'm actually going to segue because we have so many questions and I, <laughs> so I apologize to you and Carolina, but uh, take, how do you communicate to your managers, specifically male managers um, who take credit for the work you do? How do you get in front of that? Hmm. Wow. We're both taking a deep breath here. Um, <laughs> I, I will just say, Carolina, please jump in. Um, I would say confront them about it. I mean, there is a way, 
and this goes back to your confidence, not being intimidated, and knowing your worth. You know your work, and if they're taking credit for it, then you know what? Go talk to, again, that's where that mentor comes in, that sponsor comes in, because they can help you navigate that. Now, this is your manager, so you do have to work for them. So you, there is a fine line, but at the same time, if you talk to others around you, and if your work, uh, clearly I'm sure it speaks for itself, making sure that others know what you're doing. So that goes back to, the again, that mentor and that sponsor, even if your manager is taking credit, make sure everybody else around know, knows that, you know what, you were the one that, that did this. And I'm sure the word would get out, and if nothing else, your manager would, may look like, you know, not someone who is credible, and that's okay. And then hopefully you will find another opportunity that where you can, again, be given credit for your work. Good one. Anything quick on that yourself, Carolina, or should we move on? You can move on. <laughs> so, uh, from a leadership pers uh, perspective, this is not, this is I, obviously, I think, coming from a woman. Um, from a leadership perspective, we don't want to be like men, in quotes, but how do we lead with our strengths as female leaders in the workplace? Yeah, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm just quickly going to say I had a very difficult manager when I first became, uh, when I first started managing a team, and she wanted me to be somebody else that I was not. It's not me to the core. So she wanted me to be, and I won't go through through it here on this on this Zoom. Um, so I think what I would say is um, figure out what those what those um, changes are. And is, are these small incremental changes that you can make easily? But at the end of the day, I would say stick to the core of who you are. Those are your strengths, and I would use those strengths. But if there's some blind spots that we, we all have blind spots that we need to think about, so just be aware of them and see how, you know, how much do you want to pivot on those blind spots. And definitely don't become somebody else because mm -hmm. you will be miserable if you are completely changing your personality to a different Well, clearly people are struggling with the same things um, in, in a variety of ways, but I think this issue of, you know, being able to live with yourself, sleep at night, um, has a lot to do with the tactics you're going to choose, um, and, and you've clearly done some of that. Um, let me just, uh, um, we've kind of touched on this, but a quick example, as women who've chosen to make make uh, tremendous strides, how you've made tremendous strides in your field. What are some ways you've challenged yourself to stand out? Give, me a, give us a moment of when you uh, stood out, you spoke out, and you have the confidence to go for the job that you wanted in a male-dominated field. Yeah. So One example of when Yeah, absolutely. So I packed my bags and moved to New York. <laughs> <laughs> And I said I was going to work in banking, and I knocked on every single bank's door, and um, I interviewed, and um, I got the job. But I got a lot of no's, um, and even after business school, when I was interviewing for internships, I got a lot of no's. Um, but I continued persevering because that is what I wanted to do. And I think back to Rena's point about being true to who you are. You know yourself better than anybody else. Don't let anybody impose what they think you should be. You need to be confident in what you know and what you were put on this earth to do and go and do it. Um, do not let anybody mess with your path that you know in your core that you want um, to do. I think that probably, given our time frame, speaks for all of us. Um, and um, I have shared with this uh, trio that I want to mm -hmm. take them to lunch because I think we have many stories to share and also know that there is an openness on the part of the panelists. If you have a question, if you have a career path that you're interested in pursuing, if you have a situation you want to have a safe space to touch on uh, briefly with someone who's lived it, please feel free to do so. Um, and uh, without further ado, let me, let me just close out to say that um, 
you know, we, we started out here on some of the challenges, but I think you also heard the very positive way, which is a core competency, I think, of being successful, of being out there and, and tackling challenges and coming back up when um, there is a, a situation that's been tough. So I wanna say a shout out also to the men in the audience um, who've chosen to join us today to become better listeners perhaps and better supporters um, than maybe they have uh, with the women in their lives, whether it's family and friends or obviously the professional workplace. Clearly Bank of America and World Affairs Council for um, getting this out there and supporting it. Um, philosopher and writer Anne Rand had a great quote. Um, the question is not who is going to let me, it's who's going to stop me. And so I'd like to thank this unstoppable, unstoppable trio uh, for their time with us today with so much more um, to delve into as we go forward. I'd like to track their influence and impact over the coming years and pass the baton now to LJ Stamba, who leads the World Affairs Council. Thank you so very much, Laura. I hope you can all see me. I am so grateful to all of you panelists, Carolina, Tia, and Rina, for today being on this program on National Women's Day. And we had over 220 people participating, which just shows how important this topic is. And thank you so very much to Laura for moderating. So ably as always, great board members, uh, Laura and Rena, thank you for being here today. And a special thank you to Bank of America who has partnered with the World Affairs Council now for the third year to have an International Women's Day program. We're looking forward to a further discussion as we go forward to next year. And let me just say at the beginning, you saw how passionate the World Affairs Council Charlotte was about education, where we're very, very passionate about inclusion, diversity, and equity as well. And once again, thank you all for participating today. Thank you panelists. Thank you our board members, Laura and Rina. Thank you Bank of America. This session is now concluded. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.